Welcome back. So today I am talking with Chris Reed, a restaurant consultant and guru on all things food service. And we're going to talk about how restaurants can adapt to the new uh, next normal, as we're calling it. Uh, restaurants, food service, food industry in general is where Chris lives and works and has some great ideas about how uh, how all y'all <laughs> can adapt to what's going on in the world. So, uh, Chris, welcome. Thanks for joining me. And please start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself. Well, thanks for having me, David. So, um, I am the founder and executive director of a nonprofit that's based here in Charlotte called Piedmont Culinary Guild. And the guild has been operating since 2011. Um, it involves, uh, you know, a network of relationships that are chef, farmer, artisan purveyors, brewers, distillers, vintners, um, people across um, the food and the beverage space makers of all kinds and educators of all kinds. So uh, the primary um, focus of our group is to connect the local food chain and to celebrate the flavors of our region, um, leaning heavily on our growers and celebrating our growers as the, the driving force of creativity when it comes to food and beverage in our, in our community. So um, it's often said that, uh, you know, there's no reason that the, the Piedmont region of North Carolina couldn't be the Piedmont of Italy someday, you know, being a place that people travel to for flavor experiences. So it would be great to see that eventually happen here. My professional background is as a chef. So I'm a, a trained culinarian and chef. So I spent several, um, two decades in the industry. And a lot of that time was as a chef and, and some of that time was an owner. Um, I'm currently the owner of Total Hospitality Consulting. So I take on projects that are menu based, um, a lot of them are event-based, so I was heavily impacted by COVID as well, uh, losing about 48% of my total accounts in April. Um, so that's, um, that has not come back online at this point. Um, in conjunction with Total Hospitality Consulting, I work with a company called Gumbo Marketing that represents several large culinary brands like the Big Green Egg and Lodge Cast Iron. Um, and, uh, and Springer Mountain Chicken. So hmm. I am kind of all over the food space from the nonprofit side to the marketing side to um, the consulting side. I touch a lot of different pieces of the industry. Yeah, very cool. Uh, well, you certainly do wear a lot of hats and I think that's yeah, it's so nice for, uh, for me and our, and our watchers, our listeners, <laughs> our guests to hear about because you certainly must have a, a, a huge variety of experiences to draw from. And uh, the one we wanted to focus on today is uh, what kind of, uh, how you have seen restaurants successfully adapt to this. So what kind of lessons can you share with people about how restaurants or food service in general, maybe that's the distributors or the growers or the vintners or the, or the breweries, as you said, um, what kind of things have you seen them do that have been successful to adapt? And I know as a finance guy, nobody's adapting perfectly, right? You can't run, no. you can't run a business at 20% uh, this is, sales. This is, a, this is a zero sum game for almost yeah. everybody. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that the people in the, in the industry that have fared and weathered the best so far are folks that had concepts that were easily, um, that, that were already a, a good quick service options that had a to-go model in place. Yeah, um, Chick-fil-A Chick doesn't. On that. Chick-fil-A doesn't seem to be having any problems. No, right. Well, you know, but more like quick service, not fast food so much, yeah. but quick service places that had already relationships with third party uh, delivery companies and they already had their online ordering figured out and they, you know, pe people that were already kind of in that space. Um, a great example would be Yafo, you know, and some yeah. of uh, Shabelli's restaurants were already kind of sitting in that space and prepared for something like this just by the nature of their concept. Um, the, the more fine dining you go, the harder it became to sort of be in this space at all. And you really saw people quote, quote, pivot. Um, you know, you saw people going, I mean, it's, it wasn't, I don't think anybody's first inkling to go and grab, um, you know, dinner on Tuesday night at a fine dining restaurant. It right. just wasn't something that was occurring to people. So I think that um, you saw a lot of those restaurants sort of turn to uh, uh, grocerant models. Mm. Um, the grocerant model seemed to do very good, actually, for several of our local uh, businesses, and definitely a few in our membership have benefited. And they're continuing that revenue stream, um, even with 
with their 50% capacity. I mean, they almost have to. I don't, no one, no one is able to live in this environment without continuing to be innovative in the space. So gross rounds became um, one, one pivot. Um, and, and can, can you just define, we, we're going to have a lot of different people watching this. So what exactly uh, denotes a gross rent for you? A, a gross rent is, um, you know, one of the things that we saw immediately was sort of this fear of going to grocery stores or the selling out of products in grocery stores. And so what a lot of restaurants did is they were able to make purchases through their broadliner and then sell those products through their, their restaurant. So you could buy a pound of chicken, you could buy flour, you could buy mm. soap, you could buy, you know, um, okay. you could buy things from the restaurant that they were already purchasing, or they started to purchase through vendors. Yeah. Um, somebody who did a, you know, several people have done a great job at this. I know the Stanley has done a wonderful job at this. And then your mom's donuts has created a very robust um, online ordering system for groceries where people can order. I mean, she's a, she's a donut shop, but now she's selling anything from pork to you know, I think she has, you know, um, eggs and cheese and milk and, and all kinds of wow. things. So the grocery model, I think, um, picked up um, some, some of the loss for, for some of the restaurants, but, um, and they're continuing to operate in that space. Um, another thing that people did in addition to the grocery is sort of like a butcher shop model, since they were already bringing in proteins and obviously proteins were hit, our supply chain was hit very hard. Uh, by COVID, um, because a lot of these meatpacking facilities experienced a lot of employee um, disruption from illness, um, where they had to close down a lot of our, our, our processing uh, facilities around the country, which, you know, part of what PCG is all about, Piedmont Culinary Guild is all about, is sort of like realizing the consolidation of food is actually a very dangerous place to be living. Um, and, and we've actually seen that play yeah, out yeah. in the last right. few months. And so, um, you know, because of that disruption, a lot of uh, restaurants who are already buying proteins and they're able to break those proteins down, those primals or subprimals, um, could offer those um, fresh meats to their customer base. So a lot of people have done well with that. And the Stanley also has been doing that, um, the butcher shop concept um, and Old Stone Steakhouse. And there's a several, several businesses that have been doing that. Um, we also saw businesses move towards family style, really just trying to provide what's the need. Here you have all these kids at home from school and parents trying to work from home. And um, so there instantly became a huge demand for family style meals um, to go, ready to eat, what's called RTE, um, or heat and serve, where you pick it up and it's cold and then you can re-therm it later. Yeah. Um, those became huge um, opportunities as well. We saw, you know, in the Moffitt group, I know that uh, Bruce did several of, of that, uh, those style meals through Good Food on Moffitt at his concept there. Um, the other thing that we saw some people doing, I know Ilias Noches did this and a few others, um, started to do parking lot events, uh, mm -hmm. which were really cool. So, you know, kind of spacing out cars and servers, you know, you place your order and servers come out to the car with the food and they have a live band there. And so it sort of feels like a party, a parking lot party. Um, because one thing that everyone has really craved in all of this, I think, is just the human contact and the human seeing people. Um, and especially seeing people having a good time. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's been such a downer of a moment. And, you know, the, the restaurant industry, we're the makers of memories. You know, yeah. anybody in the food and beverage space, that's our, ultimately our job. And yeah. when it's been such a downtrodden time, when everybody's isolated, you're not, you're not really creating, you're not, you're not given the opportunity to do your job, which is to create the experience and the memory. Right. Yeah. Um, so we, we saw a lot of, we saw a lot of the parking lot events start starting to take place too. At this point, I think um, everyone's just sort of, you know, in this, in this survival mode moment, um, you know, people are trying to guess and, you know, figure out what is, when are we going to open at full capacity? You know, how long may we be in this 50% capacity kind of moment, uh, which makes it difficult to run any business, but especially the food and beverage, um, in the food and beverage sectors, because the margins are already so thin. Even with PPP and EIDL and all of the financial aid that people are getting, you know, those resources are running out. Um, and, the reality is setting in that if we're not back up and operating at full capacity sometime in the very near future, uh, it's just going to be a catastrophic crush um, to the industry. So right now I think people are just sort of holding their breath 
and trying to figure out, okay, if we operate in this way, how, how, what is our burn rate? I think people are really starting to get in touch with their numbers right now yeah. um, to understand like how long can we survive this way? And you know, what do we need to do to, to expand on that time if possible? Does it mean that we let our menu lead or does it mean that we cut back on our menu options or change some of our products to save some money? Or, you know, what do we do with our staffing? It's basically changing a business model like every other day. I mean, it's yeah. exhausting. It's completely exhausting for these people. So, um, you know, those were sort of the pivots that happened. And then we're sort of now in this, what, what I, I, I kind of feel is just this waiting pattern. You know, we're just kind of on the tarmac. Um, and people are just trying to, you know, guess how much gas we're going to need to get off the, get off the tarmac, you know, and we just don't know because there's just no saying a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, I mean, there is so much uncertainty, obviously every industry, almost every industry has been hit. I I think restaurants have taken more than their share in Mm -hmm. so many different ways. Uh, but I am glad to hear that there are some interesting and creative solutions out there. Maybe not solutions, but band-aids. Um, yeah, I, I hadn't even, haven't been invited to a, a parking lot party. I'm going to have to watch for one of those. Yeah, parking lot parties. <laughs> well, you know, and I wish that more, um, you know, we, we are going through such a significant change in our liquor laws, too, you know, around oh. the country. The most significant changes in liquor laws since Prohibition are taking place. Right because now. Of, because of craft brewers primarily? Is that, no, and, because, um, because, of, uh, because of COVID and because of restaurant, independent restaurant groups and brewers associations oh, really? that are um, lobbying for changes um, to ABC boards or alcohol commissions to relax um, the law on you know, serving outside of their premises. So you're now allowed to have you know, tables in your parking lot area and serve alcohol, which you could not have done that before. I see. Um, in some states, they're allowing people to package um, cocktails lidded cocktails to go. Mm. Uh, we have not seen that in North Carolina, but I know that NCRLA is still lobbying for that. Uh, that would be a game changer. I mean, as you know, restaurants, or maybe you don't, but you know, restaurants don't make their money on food anymore. They make their money right. on alcohol sales uh, right. for the most part. Yeah. Traditional re- restaurants absolutely depend on alcohol sales to survive. Yeah. So taking that out of the equation and then crippling them, handicapping them with 50% occupancy. I mean, it's absolutely disastrous. So, you know, allowing people to serve alcohol in containers to go, you know, distilled beverages in containers to go would be a game changer. I hope that North Carolina adopts this at some point very, very soon. I know that we're about to go on summer recess, so we don't have very long to, (laughs) you know, convince these people that this is the right thing to do for our restaurateurs and our beverage folks, but, um, you know, and the beverage folks on the brewery side and the distillery side, I mean, you saw a lot of the distilleries pivoted to making sanitizer and filling that need, you know, talk about innovation and really the example of a capitalist society being demonstrated and played out right there. Um, you know, but unfortunately there was not those same kind of opportunities for our breweries and, you know, a lot of our breweries depend on that in-house business, which went away and they weren't allowed to reopen, um, the way that restaurants were, created a lot of problems for them you know yeah. uh to go business is is not a business for a brewery you know yeah. i mean they certainly tried pick up windows and drive throughs and man they talk about innovation on that side too mm. um but again you know that that part of the industry is also holding their breath you know when when does this come to an end and when do we get back to when do we get when do we get to the next normal <laughs> yeah yeah right well okay so let's uh those are some great examples let's focus then on what might come about and and you and I talked previously a lot about in particular uh, an issue that I don't hear a lot in other circles which is uh, dealing with employees that end up getting COVID right I mean uh, I saw the other day that Florida hit one percent of the population is is either sick now or has been sick Mm -hmm. and while I think the newscaster was trying to say that's a really big number Mm -hmm. To me, that's that's a tiny number. That's a spark in a forest fire, right? When what it told me was 99% of the people are still yet to become sick. (laughs) And if this goes on for a long time and and we don't have a a fabulous uh, vaccine or something, there are going to be a lot of more people who either get sick or, uh, well, and end up taking time off of work, Mm -hmm. uh, depending on how sick they are, of course. Mm -hmm. But but businesses of all stripes are going to have to start to adapt to employees that can't come to work and can't. Yeah, I think that there were, I think that everyone is trying to figure out what are best practices for this scenario right now. I mean, you're really, again, going back to being handicapped and cut off at the knees, this industry. I mean, 
you, you don't have employees running out of unemployment yet. They're getting so much right. assistance from the government that there's no drive to come back to work. Right. So, you know, even though we need employees and we are hiring <clears throat> at NC Red right now, it's <clears throat> very, very few applicants coming through. Wow. And so you're kind of operating already with a skeleton crew. So if one of your crew members becomes sick, um, they are required to be um, out of work for 14 days or until they can show a negative test result. Mm. Um, so if you're down an employee or two, can you even operate? Right. Um, so that's the first part of it. The second part of it is if you know, there is a positive employee, how do you go about that? I mean, legally, you're obligated to tell your employees verbally that they've had exposure. You're not allowed to mm. mention a person's name, obviously, because of ALE and the rest of the, you know, all the protection that's there for um, to protect people's privacy. But um, you, what do you do? Do you uh, come forward to the community and say, hey, we've had a positive test and we're going to go about testing other employees and we're going to shut down for a couple of days to clean and sanitize the area to make everybody feel have the fuzzy feel good? Um, or what are we going to do? Um, and I think we've, we've seen this struggle going on, um, playing out every day right now. I mean, I, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm currently working for the Moffitt group under um, a contract and we've seen it hit two of our restaurants in the group. Um, and both times we decided to close the restaurants down and, um, to ask employees to go be tested. So that is not a model that is possible to continue though. Um, when you have a refrigerator full of food, um, that is money on the shelf uh, that is not is completely getting burned up every day that you're not open. Yeah. So, um, you know, they're just, the cash is burning on both ends for these owners. Yeah. Um, and if it takes a day to get tested and three weeks for the results to come back, what do you do in the meantime? Right. Right. So, and then if you have employees that come back, several employees end up being positive, even if they're asymptomatic, they still can't work. Right. So again, like you're going to be, you're going to be crippled there with your staffing and your labor force. So it's a real conundrum. Um, we have a meeting with our members on Sunday that we scheduled a Zoom call for to just hear what people's best practices are and what they're planning on doing or what they have done or found success with, because you're not under any obligation as a business owner to um, close your establishment if you have a test positive on, on your, you know, as an employee, you're not required to close your business. Um, so if you are closing your business, you know, is, is that again, is that a model that we can actually look to, to say, yeah, that is a successful way about going about this. Or are we, are we shooting ourselves in the foot, you know, a, a second time here? Yeah. So there's a lot to consider there and a lot of challenges. I think the thing that we really need to see the public understand is this is the new normal um, for restaurant owners. And if they have come out in public and said that they've had positive test results come through in their employment, it's by no, um, no stretch is that an indicator of their practices in house in terms of their safety and sanitation. Um, and employers cannot manage their employees when they're outside of their business. So while they can ask for and demand masks be worn and hands be sanitized and frequency of cleaning increase to, you know, high touch surface areas, when those employees leave your establishment, you don't know where they're going and what they're doing. So they yeah. could easily become vectors in your business. Um, and that's really scary. So um, it, it's, I, I, I've seen some things on social media when businesses have become transparent and say, you know, we've had this test positive, we're gonna go ahead and shut down. And you see some people in the community sort of wagging a finger at them as if they've done something wrong. You mm -hmm. know, nobody's done anything wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Every, everyone's just try, trying to survive right now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, between, between the 50% closure right now and, um, the, you know, potentially running out of, of financial aid and all of these factors put together, I mean, we're going to see a crushing consolidation of this industry in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months. It's going to take a long time for it to catch up. Um, it's, it's really, we're going to really see it when, you know, payroll taxes come due and property taxes come due and, uh, leases have to be renewed. We're going to start seeing it then. Yeah. Um, we're, we're not going to see it right now. And so it's just a very crippling thing. And it, it would be nice to see a public be empathetic to owners who are dealing with this, um, you know, on the ground issue of employees getting sick and yeah. having to, and having to navigate that, especially when some of these consumers are coming into businesses without a mask or saying that they don't want to wear a mask, you, you are potentially um, infecting employees of the business and yeah. these businesses, restaurants, restaurants, and, you know, are, are in the food service 
anybody in the food service space is considered a critical and essential workforce. So we, we really need to protect them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to consider there. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, boy, I, you're, you're bumming me out, Chris. <laughs> it's a bummer. It I is know. a bummer. It's, it it, is a bummer. It, you know, I hate to say it, but like, this is the reality and it, there's just no sugarcoating this and there's no painting rainbows on it. Yeah. And, and we need the public to understand what a dire, serious situation it is. Yeah. Um, and we need that empathy and we need that support because yeah. otherwise, you know, the memory makers will go away. Your fa- yeah. favorite restaurants will not survive this. And yeah. that is the hard facts about it right yeah. now. Yeah. So uh, to all of our watchers who are um, in the, in the industry, besides crossing our fingers and waiting for a vaccine or something else, what, what do you think they should be doing or paying attention to or looking forward to? I mean, I know it's an impossible task all the way around, but well, what are the, I think what are the that, keys? I think that in this crisis is a huge opportunity um, in terms of your time management to spend more time with your employees. Yeah. Um, really build transparency, really build communication channels, really spend time on progress and development of your employees. Mm. Make sure that they feel in the know and they're part of a solution set for your business, that they have buy-in and ownership of what's happening um, because that is key. You know, We have yeah. to keep our community strong and this community is um, built on the backs of our employees. Yeah. So we have to be putting them first in this situation. So that, that's the first thing I would say they, that people should be paying attention to. And the next thing I would say is, you know, spend this time to systemize and standardize everything. Mm. Um, very important because as you're having to, um, as you're having to roll up and down the sliding scale of phase one to phase three, which, you know, we don't know if we're going to scale back to phase one. There's no yeah. saying whether we would scale back and people would say, you know, the government says, no, I'm sorry, restaurants can't be open in North Carolina anymore. Back to to-go service. We don't know if that's going to happen or not. Right. And we also don't know if we get all the way to phase three and we're into 75% capacity or even 100% capacity that we don't have a resurgence of the virus in the fall and we slide, you know, back to phase two or phase one. So in that, if you're standardizing process and procedure and you're standardizing all your methodology and you're standardizing your recipes and making it easily trainable, you're going to be much more, um, you're going to be much more um, fluid in this environment. You can be much more nimble. Um, harder to be nimble if you don't have standardized recipes. Harder to be nimble if you don't have training materials because you're going to have a lot of retention uh, flow right now with yeah. the way that the staffing is, is um, situated. So I would say, you know, in, in that is an opportunity to systemize, standardize, and really start paying attention to your numbers. Because if people yeah. are not living on the margin right now, like I said, there's just no surviving this. Yeah. So all the attention has to go to that. Yeah, I, I like the work on your business and not in your business. I mean, this yeah, is a really right. uh, unusual time when you can't work in your business sometimes. So that's right. why not turn around and work on it? I, I love that. Yeah. Uh, it's a small silver lining. <laughs> well, and, it, and it's hard. And I, and I know that's a hard sell for a lot of folks right now because, you know, you have owners that are having to step back into operations if they've been, you yeah. know, sort of acting as an owner. They're, they're sort of back in the trenches right now. Uh, but that, again, there's an opportunity there to see your business from another perspective that maybe you were not paying attention to or seeing before. So right. You learn a lot about your business right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and so the last thing you mentioned was the, to pay attention to your numbers and to get more familiar with them and know what it takes to run your business, all that sort of thing. Is, is there a point at which you tell a guy, a, a restaurateur that you've just got to throw in the towel, that it's time to hang it up. And how do you, how do you know that? How do you know when you just, you're done? Yeah, you know, that is a really um, personal sure. and private decision that yeah. people have to make. Yeah. And I think that you have to make that decision based on how you're leveraged. And, um, you know, I think you have to base that decision on, you know, how you're able to, to maneuver in the, the phases. Um, obviously, the, the, it, the restaurants that will be most heavily impacted and will be faced with these decisions are the more fine dining type establishments, I feel like. Um, you know, that's why you've seen some of these very, um, you know, these tenured restaurants, Carpe Diem went out, Upstream yeah. went out yeah. um, in Charlotte, you know, in New York, you're seeing all kinds of tenured, very successful restaurants prune 
you know, Gabriella Hamilton closed down Prune. Yeah. Um, people that are, you know, in, in a situation where they're, you know, only able to provide small seatings and only a couple of seatings a night and they couldn't pivot well to a to-go model. I mean, there's just no telling how long we're going to have to sit in this environment before, you know, things are going to be opening back up <clears throat> to be operating in any kind of normal way. Yeah. So I think that um, right now we just kind of have to focus on uh, how to be supportive to them, how to put pressure on legislators to get that bailout money and to keep people going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very good. All right. Well, Chris, you've given us so much to chew on <laughs> to use an industry fun. Um, appreciate that insight and, and yeah, all of the unique experiences that you had and have shared with us. I hope that it hope that those words land with somebody and, and help them stay the course just a little bit longer or, or make the tough decisions in the right way to do something different. We're just all in this together right now, David. This is the only way that we're going to be able to move forward is we're sharing resources, intellectual and otherwise, yeah. um, to to build support for each other and help each other get to that next place, yeah. wh wherever that is. Awesome. Hey, remind everybody how they could uh, find you online or find the Piedmont Culinary Guild. What, what? PiedmontCulinaryGuild.com, um, okay. PCG underscore Charlotte on Instagram. Um, but that is the best way to find me and um, and learn more about our community. Yeah, and resources for restaurant tours. That's undoubtedly. right. Yeah, very good. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. Of course. And uh, we hope to see you again on the show in the future. <laughs> All right. Thanks, David. <laughs>